Now, can you imagine going to a modern bureaucrat in a big government centralized system? This is also true, by the way, of big corporations. It's why IBM didn't invent Microsoft, nor did it invent Apple. It's why General Motors, for a while, was too slow to, to, to understand what was happening with Japanese cars. Because when you're a big enough system, you can protect yourself by staying inside the system, even if you're wrong. Remember we talked about this last week. Wow, if what you're trying to do, imagine that you're the iron lung industry. And Jonas Salk shows up and says, I have this great new idea. Let's eliminate iron lungs. We'll just have a vaccine and nobody will get polio. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Do you want to encourage the end of your industry? Or are you really busy working on Project 12, which is right here, which is the better, more portable iron lung, the aluminum lung? Which one are you going to invest in? So what you want is a society with many, many small institutions. Now, another big problem is the anti-progress cultural attitude. You were laughing about when I said the modern TV would report Edison's invention as a negative. But isn't that exactly what happens? The O.J. Simpson trial is big news. The breakthroughs in genetic biology lib liberating the age of molecular medicine and saving people with fundamental genetic defects doesn't get page one very often. And, you know, and the news media can say, well, that's because they don't read it. Part of the reason they don't read it is because we don't report it. Remember, supply leads to demand. And that's part of why, what's the public reaction? You get internet, you get talk radio, you get efforts. But because we've had such a deep anti-progress cultural attitude, I mean, progress was not even a word you were allowed to use for a while. It was, it was, you know, it was like, you know, you must become some kind of romantic, you know, highly uh, uh, self-deceptive person if you actually think human beings can have progress. And there was a period there when, it, when, when everything was terrible. We talked about nihilism. You, I mean, listen to some of the rock music for, in periods when there's a sense that there is no future, that it's not going to be any better. Meanwhile, all around us are scientists and engineers and naturalists who are in discovering and inventing a lot of things. The final one, though, is just plain ignorance. The fact is, if you don't teach how to think scientifically and you don't think how to be a creator, you, know, you don't teach how to be a creator and you don't teach how to, how to discover, you don't teach how to explore, it shouldn't shock you that people can't do it. It's a very major problem that we tend to consistently score 14th or worst in science and math. Because it means we don't have a basic data. We don't have the alphabet. We don't have the basic principles of being able to operate in a world in which science is important and in which, in which learning is important. I mean, in the 19th century, people like Edison, Carnegie, the Wright brothers, Henry Ford, all got a basic education, some of them by the eighth grade, that was sufficiently powerful that it carried them the rest of their lives. We know have some people get through two years of college and they're still illiterate. I mean, just a totally different attitude towards what real learning means, what you have to master in order to be effective. Now, this does not mean, by the way, that I'm against government. I, I would say just the opposite, that government can play a powerful role in basic research and development, as long as it's willing to get, get, uh, get it out of the bureaucracy. If you go back and look at uh, Powell's great trip down the, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, which is one of the great journeys of discovery in American history, it was a government expedition. It was the U.S. Geological Survey. If you go look at Lewis and Clark reaching the Pacific, that was a government expedition. If you look at the Apollo program, uh, the fact is much of the progress on the airplane and the computer chip are financed by the government. But the trick is to get it out of this big system, over here is a freestanding small project. You cannot successfully make big breakthroughs. You can have resources leave here, the big central system, and go to a point where somebody's doing something interesting. But if you keep the resources in here, if you tie them up in bureaucracy, you will guarantee that you'll get very, very minimal progress at very big expense. Now, government can do selected big projects well, again, if they are off to one side. So let me draw two distinctions here. Government can do basic research and development, or government can come out here and set up the Apollo project. Remember, NASA was brand new. They built it up, they did it, and if they disbanded it at that point, I think they'd have been better off and said, okay, now, let's, now what's our next project? So you build a project team, you get the job done, and you close it down and start a new project team. Because if you keep the people there, they become obsolescent and they become bureaucratic. And what you're looking for, remember, is not incremental change. You're not looking for a slow, gradual change. You're looking for the breakthroughs. How do we manage? What is it worth, that's worth doing that's big? Now. 
big projects must be focused, lean, and tightly managed. And we're going to look at the skunk works at Lockheed as an example. But it's a very important concept that they have to be focused. You have to know, you know, in other words, why are we setting up this agency? To accomplish X. Not to do 12 things, to do one thing. It's got to be lean, and you'll see what I mean by lean in just a minute. Very few people. And you've got to have very tight management. The fewest people possible, working as well as they can, getting it done, and then getting it over with. Now, I want you to look at Kelly Johnson, who's the father of the Skunk Works, who is, in a sense, to aviation, sort of the, the uh, Thomas Edison of modern aviation. Let's take a look at Kelly Johnson. Lockheed was already swamped in terms of manpower, tooling, and facilities with wartime contracts. But this was a blessing in disguise, an opportunity to implement an idea he'd been pestering Robert Gross about for years. Let him round up a small group of talented people, designers, engineers, and shopmen, put them under one roof where they could all work closely together, and give him complete authority over everything from procurement to flight test. With no other options, Gross said, go ahead. Stealing people from around the plant, just 28 engineers, including himself, and 105 shopmen, he also built a small facility out of discarded shipping crates using a circus tent for a roof. On June 19th, he laid down the principles under which the project would operate. In one and a half pages, now preserved on old photostats, they formed the basis for how he'd try to operate for the next 30 years. He'd be responsible for all decisions. Paperwork and red tape would be cut to the minimum. Each engineer would be designer, shop contact, parts chaser, and mechanic, and each would remain within a stone's throw of the shop at all times. There'd be but one object, to get a good airplane built on time. He'd promised the airplane in 180 days, as would become his custom. He gave his men 150. The clock started ticking on June 23rd. Remarkably, the completed aircraft arrived at Muroc on November 14th, just 143 days after startup. When he retired in 1975, Kelly Johnson had been on the cutting edge of an advance from 200 to more than 2,000 miles per hour. He'd been involved in the design of 44 different airplanes, many of them among the classics of aviation history. And at the time, he was still looking very much into the future. He'd gotten the Skunk Works into a project which would bear fruit in the F-117A world's first true stealth aircraft. What was his secret? Well, he had a remarkable capacity to take a complex problem, reduce it to its simplest components, and then take the most direct and sensible approach to its solution. Always a maverick, he was smart enough and tough enough not to follow the committee rule of conventional wisdom. This gave him remarkable freedom. With that freedom came a tremendous burden of responsibility. Finally, and most important, he understood himself well enough to realize that with a few good people, you can do remarkable things. Kelly Johnson's greatest legacy wasn't just what he did, but the way he did it. <laughs>